Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to our latest community conversation. We're going to be looking at the recent anticipated reaction in 2022, a global overview report today. Uh, this was launched by the Anticipation Hub in April in Geneva at Humanitarian Networks and Partnerships Weeks. And what we've got today is a few of the Anticipation Hub's partners uh, will share their reflections on the report. Uh, I will give a short presentation just for anyone who's not familiar with the report, who hasn't had time to fully digest it yet, just very brief highlights. And then we're going to open the floor to the audience to share your own reflections. It can be something you, interesting you found in the report, it can be a question or something that's not clear from the presentations or the discussion, or it could be a suggestion for next year's report, because as I think quite a few people know, this is going to be the first in an annual series. Um, we're hoping that over time these will build into a kind of set of data about how anticipatory action grows and develops over the years. Um, so this is the first edition. Uh, we're going to look forward um, as well during the conversation. And I think uh, just to start off, we should probably acknowledge that while the logo on the front cover is the Anticipation Hub, I'll just... There it is in all its glory. Um, this was a collaborative effort. The uh, Anticipatory Action Task Force was involved in preparing the report, in writing the report, editing, providing criticisms and constructive inputs all the way through, and also verifying the data. I'll, I'll run everyone through the data very shortly, but yeah, it was a, a team effort. So we'd just like to acknowledge that as well. Okay, I will start with a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, let me just... See how that's... this is going to be quite quick. We're just going to share the. Let me just see how it works. Yeah. Oh, sorry about that. Is that showing yet or? Not yet. No. Uh, okay, um, let me just try again. Is it showing now? Yes, I can see. Great. It. Ah, great. Finally, thank you. So yeah, um, the anticipatory action in 2022 global overview report. Um, as I mentioned, it was launched in April. Uh, why did we do this? Well, really, because anticipatory action has been growing a lot in recent years. You know, as a sector, as a field, but there wasn't one uh, set of yeah one place where someone could get an overview of everything that's going on. So that was why we wanted to collect that data all in one place, do some data crunching, do some analysis and say, you know, where are we at after a few years of the anticipation approach being implemented? You know, where are we at in 2022 and where are we going in the future? How did we do it? Uh, we had a consultant uh, for a few months last year, Joanna Smith, who was based at the Climate Center. She was very uh, busy last year with collecting all the data that she could find, you know, desk research, contacting organizations and putting all of this into uh, databases for us and spreadsheets. Uh, quite, a, quite an expensive bit of work. There's an awful lot of figures and numbers flying around. Um, and then what we did, because that, that research took place during the year, we asked all our partners and everyone who's active in this sector. So particularly the START Network, uh, WFP, the World Food Programme, Food and Agriculture Organization, the Red Cross, Red Crescent Movement, and UN OCHA. We asked them to verify the data. So the data that Joanna had collected from these different organizations, we sent it to them and said, can you please check this? You know, um, check if it needs updating, check uh, if there's kind of more recent updates on the number of people that you reached or the impacts of uh, what you did. And who did it? Well, as mentioned, it was the, the members of the Anticipatory Action Task Force. Um, in future editions, we're hoping that we can broaden out the people contributing to the data um, and to ensure that we collect more of the locally led uh, anticipatory action projects that are going on and also perhaps some of the, the ones that aren't covered by like the, the, the big funds out there. So the, the SURF, the DREF and the START funds. So you know, the, there's other anticipatory action going on and we want to make sure that we include those in the aggregated data as well. So the first set of data we collected was active frameworks. What do we mean by active? Um, this means any kind of protocol or document or framework that's 
uh, sets out the pre-agreed actions, the pre-agreed financing and the hazards and the triggers that are being worked towards. So an example from the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement is the early action protocols. Some of you will be familiar with those. Um, it's just worth noting at this point that not every organization included in the report actually has a framework system in place. Some of them base uh, their activations on expert advice or expert figures. And that's all detailed in the report. But we, we mapped out the frameworks um, that we knew about all around the world and the map there shows those and when you pull all the data together there were 35 countries with a framework in 2022 70 actual frameworks now it's not uh, two per country obviously some had more some had others um, and when you aggregate all the data together the number of people covered by these frameworks was 7.6 million um, and just one kind of caveat that we should add in there is that you lose a little bit of a nuance when you aggregate data at a global scale. So one person could be someone that received a very active form of early action, such as a cash transfer or an evacuation, but it also includes those who might have just received the early warning um, message or something similar. Uh, due to the this being the first uh, report in the series, we didn't actually plot the early actions implemented for each activation, but it's something we're looking at doing in the future. But just so you know, 7.6 million people doesn't mean they all receive cash or they all received you know health and nutrition packs. It's it's all the different types of early actions out there. And when you uh, collate all the financing that was um, covered by these frameworks, it reached uh, 138 million US dollars in different currencies. But we sort of put it all into US dollars just to, for ease of cross reference. Uh, one interesting fact in terms of these active frameworks, this is something that I think has been a, a little bit surprising for some people. Um, kind of by quite a long way, the, the hazard that was most commonly covered by a framework was drought. Um, this, like I said, yeah, a few people have been a bit surprised by that. But yeah, this is what we found from the data and you can see the others there on the screen. We also looked at which organizations were implementing which frameworks for um, which has it and yet yeah, it's a almost a dead heat between the UN agencies and the Red Cross Red Crescent agencies and the NGOs could be underrepresented as, as I mentioned we, we worked with Start Network in particular and their partners but there could be other forms of anticipated action out there that we just didn't map um, due to the methodology we use and it's something we're looking at in the future. Second and perhaps kind of the one of the most important sets of data is the actual activation. So the first one was the, the frameworks in place, but these are which ones are actually activated. And again, the, the map sort of gives an impression of where around the world um, these were activated, these frameworks. And if we move to the next slide, we can see the summary figure. So there's 47 actions, uh, activations around the world. These reached 3.6 million people, 53.8 million US dollars. And I think one of the interesting points is there was at least 56 organizations involved. So a lot of the large organizations, uh, particularly the Start Network, they work with local NGOs to uh, actually implement the actions um, that are set out in their anticipatory action frameworks. And another, it's, it's something else that we'll look at. And yet, um, they took place in 30 countries uh, and in every month of the year. Um, so yeah, it's it's happening all through the year, anticipatory action, at least in 2022. The third large data set we collected was the frameworks under development. And uh, now this is slightly fuzzy definition because you know under development could mean well it's just an idea in someone's head or there's been some initial documents uh, discussions about it between partners. So the way we define that is that there's been some initial steps to make sure that the the process is happening. So it could be to agree on the start discussions about which triggers will be used or which sources of finance are going to be done or you know certainly ongoing discussions about you know which are the most appropriate early actions to do in that context and ahead of that hazard um so yeah it's it's something perhaps that is slightly less certain than the other data but it's where do we know that um frameworks are happening around the world uh, or being developed around the world. And the summary figures here are again, drought is the highest with 35 frameworks under, under development around the world. And we've also broken that down by organization. Um, and so you can see the, the UN agencies and also the Red Cross Red Crescent agencies there. And yeah, and 51 of those 97 frameworks were started in 2022. So it does show that even if the uh, this is our baseline figure, basically. We can't tell exactly yet if anticipatory action is growing or contracting, but 
given the number that were started um, in 2022, it seems to be that there is an increase in the number of countries and the number of hazards being covered by anticipatory action. And when we collect the data for 2023, which will be in next year's report, we'll really see you know, some, some a bit more firmly how, how big a growth that is or possibly a decline, but we're not expecting that. Also in the report, you can find some thematic coverage from 2022. Uh, that can be in terms of the major milestones, new research, new evidence, new methodologies. We looked at the regional highlights, what's been happening in Asia Pacific, what's been happening in the Middle East, North Africa, and what's been happening in Africa and also Latin America and the Caribbean. And we also provided some thematic overviews. Uh, for the first report, these were basically drawn from our working groups, Anticipation Hubs working groups, but it, they're not set in stone. We're not going to be looking at those six themes every single year. Um, so one thing that would be useful to get feedback on during the discussion later is what themes should we be covering perhaps for next year's report? So when we look at 2023, are there kind of major trains that are happening now that we should be covering in the report in the future? We don't have to cover these six again. So any thoughts there from the participants and panelists would be, would be great to have. And finally, the last section of the report is just to look, look forward, you know, what does this data actually mean? What does it mean for policy? What does it mean for the sector as a whole? What does it mean for donors, governments? We base that around the five key policy asks from the Anticipatory Action Task Force. And yeah, again, it's, it's probably easiest just to, to take a look in the report, see what do you think there? And yeah, that again will be something that we change each year. So that's the presentation over. So thank you very much. Let me just end my, yep. Okay, great. So what I'd like to do next is move to uh, the panelists. And first of all, uh, one of our colleagues based in Latin America um, is unable to join us personally, uh, I think partly due to the time distance, uh, but he's also got um, a field visit today. So uh, he sent us a short video. And uh, Shauna, if you could just play the video for us, that'd be great. Hello to all the anticipation community. Un gran saludo desde de, de Tegucigalpa, Honduras. My name is Mauricio Santos. I work in the delegation of German Red Cross in Central America, from where we give technical support to all the national societies who are interested to adopt anticipation mechanism and be part of this movement who works to make the humanitarian war a community more effective and efficient regarding the new and not so new humanitarian challenges. From our perspective, the most important finding from the Global Overview Report is the evidence of the huge interest global-wide that involves our initiative. We can see that in 2022, more than 70 organizations around the world have been working to establish anticipation mechanism. In, this is a demonstration that anticipatory action is not yet an exotic approach. Now, we hear it in the voice of governmental representatives and other stakeholders everywhere. That also means that we left behind the, met the methodological discussion, and we are now in a new context more related with the need to scale up and expand the scope of the anticipation to more geographical areas and more hazard and crisis. In what concerns our region, we had important achievements, not just because at the end of 2022, we had the possibility to work anticipatory action mechanisms in more countries, but also we had important steps to explore explore the adaptation of this approach to new crises as methodological, methodological droughts, migration crises, epidemics, and complex crises. Last year, we had the possibility also to implement anticipatory actions in Honduras and Guatemala with the activation of their own early action plans for floods. In October, the Hurricane Julia has impacted communities from the coast, coast of both countries. These two national societies were able to assist more than 20,000 people who were in the path of the hurricane, achieving early mitigation of the potential impacts of floodings. This act activation gave us important lessons learned to continuing with uh, improve of our, in, the improve of our work. From our perspective, the future has three priorities uh, for our region. The first one is to continue 
exploring all the possibilities that the anticipation mechanism could offer to cover more risk and crisis. The second one is to bring the approach closer to the communities and subnational territories more exposed. In that sense, we are already working in a more coordinated way with other critical organizations as ECHO, FAO, WFP, among others. And the last one is maybe the most critical and is related to get um, on board of the anticipation ship, the governments and system for risk reduction in a much clearer way in terms of financial complementarity and legal commitment. That's all from my part. I, I wish that this report has given you as much, as much reasons as it has given us to continue to work resolutely for anticipation. Un fuerte abrazo desde las Américas. There we go. Um, just, just a quick one, Tim. Uh, you're on mute, um, but uh, I noticed a little alert on the page earlier uh, mm -hmm. saying that the meeting was going to end. So I think that means that this has been set up on um, one of the non-paid for Zoom accounts. Um, so if everyone could just, if that does happen, um, if you could just all rejoin using exactly the same Zoom link, um, I think it will just restart. Um, so that should be happening in about four minutes time. And just big apologies to everyone for that. We'll make sure that doesn't happen again. Great, thanks, Shona. Yeah, sorry about that, uh, everyone. I hadn't hadn't realised that that might happen. Um, okay, so possibly with an interruption in between, I'd like to first of all ask uh, Daniela uh, something about the report. And the question is, which trend or fact did you find the most concerning in the data that was presented? Okay, thanks, Tim. And um, my name is Daniela Lanean. I work at the National Meteorological Service in Argentina and the Head of Meteorology and Society Department. Uh, first of all, I would like to express my congratulations to the whole team that has worked on this report. And I believe that having this valuable information allows us to take action and encourages us to show the importance of working on anticipatory action. So thank you very much also for the opportunity to share thoughts and reflection on this important report. Um, the report is an outstanding global overview of how anticipatory action has been developed and scaled up in recent years. And also with this concrete contribution to analyze the current global initiative through an integrated perspective. Uh, through the report, we, we can see that we still need to threaten anticipatory action in South America. And I consider that is the most concerning um, fact that I, that I find found on the report. Uh, I, I think that we also need to continue working on practical implementation and also analyze the implementation processes on this of the framework. Um, another point that I think that is maybe necessary to threaten collaboration among different institutions. And it is something that we uh, point here in South America to, to coordinate these actions and to ensure a more coordinated approach to develop anticipatory action frameworks. But what is good news, I think, is that we can know that in 2022, some countries have started the process of developing frameworks. Argentina is a, an example of this, which is a good sign for the red region and also I consider that it's um, necessary to develop different strategies to spread the word about the importance of having these, these frameworks and also the benefits of working together different different among different institutions in anticipatory actions. Once again, uh, congrats for this report. It's uh, really an understanding and it's it encourages us, as I said before, to, to take action and keep it in our spirit of the world. So thanks again. Thank you, Daniela. Uh, just uh, very quickly while we're here, um, if anyone in the audience has questions uh, for any of the speakers today, please do just pop them in the chat. Um, and uh, we'll answer them at the end. We'll let everyone speak first. Uh, and then if you have questions, we'll go through them at the end. So either you know, just raise your hand at the end or just pop them in the chat now. 
Um, it looks like we might be about to restart the meeting. I do apologize for that. I'm not quite sure that that's happened. Um, but yeah, let's uh, just carry on as in, in fingers crossed and hope that it doesn't happen. Um, so the next person I'd like to speak is uh, LK. And perhaps you could answer the same question. Uh, which, which of the trends in the data or in the report did you find the most concerning uh, or you know, raised, a, raised a flag for you? Right. Thank you so much, Tim, and good, hello, colleagues. Um, I have less than a minute, but I hope when we reconnect, we, I can have uh, some more time just to express my, my views on the report. So my name is LK Makassil. I'm Program Officer from the Climate Risk Early Warning System. Hello, once again, colleagues. Um, i like to introduce myself. Uh, once again, my name is LK. Kay Makassil, I'm Program Officer from the Climate Risk Early Warning System uh, Cruise Initiative Secretariat. So I am based in Geneva and we're hosted by the World Meteorological Organization. So just an in, as an introduction, so if we recall, one of the areas of action in the Paris Agreement uh, includes increasing access to early warning systems. Uh, the reason behind is that it's a very tangible way to minimize loss and damages to ex extreme hazards. And it's also an essential element of anticipatory action. And uh, CRUS remains to be the only operational funding mechanism at the moment, supporting action on every element of effective early warning system and services. And we help build uh, capacities of institutions in least developed countries and small island developing states um, in terms of um, addressing the gaps and filling in the gaps in the early warning system value chain. So we welcome very much the global report on anticipatory action. Um, it provided um, good highlights um, on the significant progress on anticipatory action. And uh, we're very much interested in reading all the case studies that were documented there on the ground and the milestones highlighted and key recommendations moving forward. Now, reading through the report once again, one key message that came across to me is that despite the significant progress and increased awareness, uh, we need to continue to challenge ourselves challenge everyone who has an interest and everyone who has at stake um, in anticipatory action because there still remains a number of issues that need to be addressed. And I'd like to highlight two of which, um, which are very close to our mandate in the CRUISE initiative, one of which is on financing. So I'm coming from a funding mechanism and it concerns me that investments for anticipatory action remain to be limited. Yes, of course, the report has highlighted the efforts made by Germany, for example, on allocating um, or committing 5% of its humanitarian budget to anticipatory action and IFRC um, with uh, increased allocation on its draft funding and OCHA. And we recognize the launch of global initiatives like the Global Shield Against Climate Risk and the Early Warning for All initiatives. All this provide um, opportunities to scale up. And uh, we would like to see how these global initiatives actually integrate much better into national country level systems and processes and have more stakeholders engagement. On the part of CRUS, we um, just to let you know, last week our steering committee has approved our scaling up framework with a with a green climate fund, and this will enable fast track access to GCF finance of of, of up to twenty five million US dollars for projects that have demonstrated scalable elements through CRUS investments. And it goes without saying that. In the early warning value chain, the element that really requires scaling up is on preparedness and response. And we look forward to working closely with all the actors involved in this. So um, a second concerning issue is because it's not new, but um, it still persists, is this issue on coordination at all levels. Um, and this was also mentioned by our colleague from the Argentina uh, Met Office. And I know efforts are ongoing at global and local levels. 
And there are many opportunities to coordinate and concretely deliver. But what puzzles me is um, what are the hurdles to actually sustain this coordination mm -hmm. and genuinely um, coordinate um, in the institutions and among the people in these um, institutions. Because we all know for a fact that even if coordination can be time consuming, it is worthwhile because you, we can always maximize resources and capacities by coordinating. And we will have more confidence that our work will be followed through if we are coordinating and building that um, ownership. So these are just a few points from our end. And once again, congratulations to the Anticipation Hub and the Anticipatory Action Task Force for the report. Many thanks. Thank you so much, LK. So uh, next, I would like to uh, head to Uganda and uh, our colleague from the Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Center, Irene. And uh, Irene, what would you like to see covered in future editions of the overview report? Is there anything that was missing this time around that you think should have been in there that we could add for the future? Uh, thank you, Tim, and uh, thank you, dear colleagues. Uh, again, I can't emphasize how excited I am to see this product finally come to, you know, come to light. And for me, this report is a testament of our walking the talk, because we've been talking about anticipatory action, and now this is an opportunity for us to display the practical uh, application of this. And uh, given that this is our first, you know, I'm so excited, I'm still celebrating, and I'll focus on being forward looking in terms of what uh, I would like us to reflect into um, uh, our next uh, edition of the report. So when I look at the report, I am excited and at the same time, you know, having a, a, a few concerns, especially with the focus on silent hazards. Of course, we are talking about expanding uh, and covering most of these hazards, but particularly my interest is drawn on heat, you know. Uh, most of the heat frameworks, both are already active and under development, are actually in Asia. And yet, when you look at the projections, the climate projections for Africa, Africa is expected to actually surpass Asia with the high increased level of exposure. And so uh, I, I would be keen to see that the next report uh, should help us uh, uh, bring these silent issues on the table. So even if, for example, uh, uh, one could argue that, you know, because sometimes heat waves is a, a kind of compounding risk with drought, it kind of gets lost in there. And also Africa being a very special place that sometimes data, most times really, I'm just being modest, most times data is not uh, 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 that available. Uh, just give you a minute. Sorry about that. Yes. So uh, because the reporting on heat waves is, you know, is, is really limited, this doesn't mean that it isn't an issue uh, in, in Africa. So I'd like to see attention drawn to this silent, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to the silent hazards. And, and then also looking at, you know, the numbers growing that Africa should also be now focusing on, on, on heat waves. We should be having frameworks or better still, we should set a trend to be able to, 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 have, um, uh, to have heat waves on the map. Then there's a lot of impact we are reporting about within, within the report. I would love to see uh, 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 communities speaking for themselves. I know we've done reports, uh, for example, the initial reports on Bangladesh, you know, the, the, the first uh, 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 reports around anticipatory action for Bangladesh, you know, we had human faces attached to all the impacts that we are talking about. And I think we should have the same trend in our reports as uh, as well. You know, if we are talking about people in Somalia being able to afford, you know, the, the constant um, meals because we provided them with, that, with anticipatory action. If we are talking about people not coping negatively because of anticipatory action, let's have human uh, uh, voices attached to this uh, to these impacts. I think uh, they are better place to tell our story uh, uh, better than better than we do. So I would love to see that. In addition to government voices, we've been singing about, you know, integrating uh, uh, AA into DRM frameworks, working together with governments. Can we have the government speak to our impact and influence that we've made? There are quite a number of advances and efforts we've made in terms of influencing uh, government. So 
uh, uh, hearing them speak for themselves for me would be uh, exciting and, and as well also I think motivating to other government partners as um, as well. Elkaya talked about you know uh, um, coordination. You know it's happening very well at global level. I would love to see another Bangladesh story, you know, replicated at large scale where we have more than one organization working together to ensure that we are providing anticipatory action at scale. Can we have that happening in Uganda? Can we have that happening in, 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 in you know, uh, uh, in Southern Africa? Can we have it everywhere? Because we are desperate for coordination. It is challenging, it's resource intense, it's time intense, but we all agree that it's worth the effort. So can we come up with, uh, uh, um, can we come up with, you know, evidence, this is how we've worked at a country level. These are the challenges that we've had. This is what we are celebrating. Uh, and, and so for me, that would be another focus I would like to see in the report. And related to that also, there are quite recommendations around learning as well, we celebrate, uh, um, we celebrate the, the, the successes around also documentation and research. One of the things that I'm increasingly learning and also uh, uh, carefully trading on is telling <coughs> learning and lessons we've learned from failure. Because in most cases, we tend to zoom in into what is working well, rightfully so. But I also believe we silently struggle with lots of things. And personally, there is no shame in us boldly saying we tried this, it didn't work out, and we shouldn't be penalized, you know, for, for saying something didn't work out, yet we envisioned it to do, you know. So I would be keen for us to also celebrate our learnings from failed endeavors and, and letting people learn from what we think we, we hoped it would come out well, but it uh, but it didn't. I think for me, that would also be quite, um, uh, quite helpful. And finally, but not least, I am excited that, you know, we have uh, 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 71 frameworks, active frameworks in 35 countries, and there is the ambition to ensure that the whole world is covered with early warning and early action. So, in the next report team, our headliner should be the contribution towards what percentage of the world we are covering. Yes, we have 7.6 million right now. You know, yes, what I, I, we should be bold enough and say collectively as the anticipatory, uh, anticipatory action community, we should tell the, the, the UN Secretary General that this is our contribution to this uh, to this ambition. So linkages with these ambitions, I would be keen, you know, to have it as some of our headliners in our next edition. Otherwise, teams, thank you so much for leading the team in writing this. And to all the team that is here, thank you for contributing in one way or another to our collective story around anticipatory action. Over to you, team. Thank you so much, Irene. And uh, yeah, we've still got six months left in the year, so I'm sure we can uh, reach everyone in that time. Not at all problematic. <laughs> so uh, our last panelist today is going to be Rudra from the Nepal Red Cross Society. And let me, where's the question? Um, Rudra, you were going to talk to us about what you think the most important finding in the research and in the report uh, was. Uh, thank you, Tom. Thank you very much. This is Rudra Adhikari. Actually, I am the Deputy Director for uh, Nepal Red Cross Society Disaster Management Department, and I am the focal person for the anticipatory actions from the Nepal Red Cross Society. Uh, first, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to anticipatory hub uh, for this opportunity to Nepal Red Cross Society to review the reports and to share our reflection on the reports. Yes, uh, going through the reports, uh, I found that uh, the evidences are collected uh, from around the globe, and these reports provide detailed information on what is happening in where uh, in anticipated actions. I think that many policymakers, practitioners, uh, researchers, uh, donor agencies, and academia will be able to learn from the reports more about the initiatives on anticipated actions. And this information can be beneficial to expand and scale of anticipated actions across the globe. Uh, the report highlights uh, the multi hazards focus thresholds, triggers, risk communication, audio warning system, and locally lead practices on anticipated actions just for the vulnerability and exposure. So that I think that it can be the referencing documents to scale up multi multi others focus anticipated actions to the humanitarian and authorities. Similarly, uh, just I reviewed that the report tells about the institutionalizations inlining anticipated actions into the government policy, strategy, and plans. 
which is a significant part of the report. This may be create positive environment to the governments to institutionalize anticipated actions, uh, ensuring the government engagement with adequate funding for its effectiveness and sustainability. Uh, uh, likewise, another findings like very important for me is that findings provide evidences for, uh, of the current scale of practical implementation, the ongoing research and innovation to expand this approach and initial efforts toward the greater collaboration between the different humanitarian organizations. This is also very important part in the report. And the report explored the pragmatic ways by different organizations to address the multi-hazards, because already in the report, it is mentioned there are 18 hazards focus information in the report. Really, really, this is, for me, the amazing things in the report. And most highlighting uh, points in the reports, like the five recommendations highlighted in the reports, are an important part that help all these, all the actors to expand, improve and scale of anticipated actions in the future for timely and effective anticipated actions, ensuring the funding and partnership, advancing the science and technology and promoting indigenous practices and knowledge. Uh, report presents multi other best possible anticipated actions. That is another very important part, which are developed and tested by the several organizations like Red Cross Education Movement, UN agencies, and different international uh, non-government organizations, including government authorities. The key new uh, anticipated actions highlighted in the reports found that the animal vaccination, fur barrier construction, and the protection of grazing area for livestock. So likewise, veterinary care, cholera response, water purification, helping homeless people, multi-purpose cash supports, evacuation travelers, shelters, gender responsive messaging, nutrition, building social cohesion and the reducing tension, support drought tolerant states and micro irrigation. Really, really, these are the important actions and it might be replicated in the many countries based on the hazards and the risks of the country contest. I found that very interesting points included in the reports. And another amazing and very interesting things uh, found in the report is that these studies from the many countries demonst demonstrated the field level actions and reflections of the beneficiaries which is a good part to know the exact situation and the actions of effectiveness of anticipatory actions ac across the world globes. The report highlights report, uh, efforts on the effective early warning with the collaborations between the hydrological and meteorological departments, humanitarian and development communities. This is the another reflection on the reports. In, in overall, really, report gives the provides the clear pictures who are engaging what anticipated actions and how many frameworks are already there. And in overall, uh, the report, reports found more comprehensive, evidence-based, highlighting the different area of anticipated actions. And this will be value added to global community policy makers, practitioners, academia, researchers to know more about the anticipated actions, helping to the most vulnerable people across the globe. This is my findings. And just from Tim, I have one another recommendations for the future reports here as well. Actually, concentrating in the Nepal and then the like the Bangladesh and other countries, I have some the learnings from the other countries here as well. Definitely, in the community level, in the field level, many of you know the indigenous knowledge and the knowledges, indigenous practice are very good practice and knowledges within the communities. So that uh, that might be the very good uh, you know the uh, initiatives for the global communities and different agencies and the humanitarian actors. They have developed the scientific tools, technologies for the risk assessment and for the anticipated action as well, so that grounded on the, you know, the field level or digging out the, you know, the in-depth uh, studies from the field level, it might be good to reflect those types of initiatives as well. For instance, I have one evidence is that in the context of Nepal, uh, Nepal Red Cross Society, together with the different participating national society like Danish Red Cross, British Red Cross, and funded from the eco projects, we have implementing anticipated actions more than you know the 20 municipalities across the country, and we have very big learnings at the field level, so that it might be good to reflect in the reports, sharing the wider communities about the best practices, learnings, and implementation challenges. Finally, thank you very much for this opportunity to reflect on the report, my perceptions, my views, and everything. And thank you too, so much to you. If any uh, another information required, I will be happy to share to you. Thank you, team, and over to you as well. Thank you so much, Rudra. And uh, yeah, just to, to pick up on that point, actually, and also the point that Irene made about communities. Um, while we were report, uh, writing the report, actually, and working with the members of the Anticipatory Action Task Force, 
um, there was feedback from the team that were writing and contributing and reviewing each section that, yeah, there was a, an underrepresentation of locally led anticipatory action. Um, you know, looking at the local indigenous knowledge, looking at some of the smaller scale projects, the ones that we miss perhaps with our methodology of looking at the big funds and then going down from there. And yeah, what I can share now, I don't think it's a big secret, but uh, in, in between publishing the report and now, we've actually decided to work with some of those uh, stakeholders who come from particularly World Hunger Hilfer and the Start Network on a shorter briefing, looking specifically at locally led anticipatory action. Now, that doesn't mean we're not going to include it in next year's reports, but you know, we, we, we acknowledge that um, it was actually you know, underrepresented. There's a small box on there, but yeah, we're going to work on a briefing to explain what is this, you know, locally led. You know, how why is it important? How can it make a difference? So yeah, it should be coming out before the global dialogue platform in October. So yeah, we'll we'll share that as well when people go. Um, I'd like to open now to the audience and see, does anyone have any questions about the report, about the comments uh, that the panelists have made, or reflections yourselves on the on the report itself? Yeah, the floor is open. So while we wait for people to formalize their reports, just stick your hand up when you're ready. And I have a question for Daniela actually, which, which is something that's come up before in my mind and also where we were collecting the data, is that you mentioned um, from the data, there's, there's, there's fewer projects and frameworks and activations in South America. What do you think might be the reasons for this, particularly compared to Central America, where there seems to be quite a lot more going on? I think, as I mentioned before, that it's still the, it is necessary to speed the work to know more the benefits about the anticipatory action. And also, uh, I, I was thinking through the, this reflection, the importance of working in the multi-hustle approach. That it's um, also a, a shift uh, that we, we need to consider. Uh, to strengthen our early warning system and um, to, to integrate different institutions. I think it's a, it's a need to still in South America to coordinate actions, to know more about these benefits, and also to we need to, to work more on the impact data. We need to, to access to that information to, to maybe to threaten this co these coordinations because if we if we know more about the uh, impact data maybe we we start it a little by little uh, pay more attention to the importance of anticipatory action great thank you yeah i mean that's that's also kind of you know the report goes up to collecting the statistics uh but it doesn't really quite yeah you know, apart from a few cases we haven't quite gone beyond that uh, into what does that actually mean for communities you know what does that actually mean for the target populations in terms of the actions that they were part of or um, you know they benefited from ahead of a hazard uh Loic, perhaps you'd like to ask your question to the panelists thanks uh, you can hear me Thanks a lot for, for giving me the floor. And uh, so I'm Loic, I've been working on, on some like an anticipatory action project with the Red Cross, namely in East Africa. So I'm quite interested in, in the topic. And uh, one one thing that strikes me when, when looking at the report, and I know it's not easy, but maybe uh, an avenue to, to improve in the future is, so we know the active framework, we know where there are frameworks, but then it's always complicated to know what was implemented and like, you know, maybe have a map with a better idea of like, was it implemented after the disaster or, or not? And, and what is a bit like the reach um, of the, um, because quite often we see also a discrepancy between what is in the agreement and what was really implemented. And this distance between when it should be implemented and who should receive the program uh, comparing to what what you agreed on is is it's a nuance that is quite important to get also for policy maker i think in the future to make decisions on you know because more and more we are hearing stories about you know the the framework was not triggered and it should have been triggered for whatever reason, technical reasons, there are a lot of debates on this, but still there is something here that I think we should we should maybe um, 
identify a bit better on you know was it was it needed to be triggered is it triggered only every five years every 10 years where people need it like a bit more so this question of like was it supposed to be triggered the activation and who is re who is receiving it uh, in terms of caseload from the total country because we saw some and um, some EAPs that are very localized so those two dimensions I think we cannot see them really in the report would be great if in the future there are ways to, to present a bit those dimensions to to get a better to get a better understanding yeah, thank you, Locke. Um, just just on that very quickly before I ask the panelists to reflect. Um, the the idea of this report was to try and summarise the data. So we, we are going to lose some of the nuance. And in our original uh, planning, it was going to be 20 pages and it ended up at 44. So it's already kind of <laughs> expanded beyond the initial scope. And we're kind of, I guess we're trying to strike that balance between, between providing a, too much detail in the report. We wanted in particular to be for governments, perhaps even the media and also those new to the sector, so they can get a, a sense of what, what this thing is. And But I mean, yeah, that, that would be a really useful set of data to, to collect in terms of, um, you know, this number of people benefited, but how many is that out of the total needs in that country? Um, and I guess the, the comment from the Anticipation Hub is that this is the first report we don't know yet know where it's going to go you know if every report i'd like to think starts small and then grows and expands as as you get more data more uh, inputs possibly more money to do it <laughs> a bit more time um but yeah there's no reason at all why the report can't grow and provide that kind of context and that uh, level of detail if if that's what people say they want you know if they're looking for more than just an overview they want um much more detail within one report, then yeah, that's a direction we can certainly look at. Um, I just want, uh, Michelle's got her hand up, but I just wanted to see if, if any of the panelists have anything else to reflect on on what uh, Loic said. Please just un unmute and join the conversation. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Louis, for your reflections. It is a conversation that uh, is happening internally also within the Red Cross, and I think you mentioned you're with the you're with the Red Cross as well. So um, yeah, we've had what we call the missed opportunities, and so it's about understanding, you know, uh, did we go wrong? Uh, where can we improve, and how do we make our EAPs as relevant as uh, as possible? So there has to be a case by case analysis of each event for us, you know, to be able to endpoint uh, to what a particular challenge could be. I also know that the American Red Cross is conducting an analysis of all the EAPs that have so far been developed. So hopefully that would also give us an idea in terms of, you know, what is the picture? What do we do? Where do we need to be improved? This also, these are so some of the conversations that are happening within the PNS coordination groups and. It is a growing uh, 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 conversation. And like uh, Tim say, depending on the need and or focus from more readers, then we get to zoom in what to focus on into the next report. In the meantime, internally uh, as a movement, I think we have that space to be able to explore the pertinent issues that you raise. Thank you. Thanks, Irene. Uh, we're, yeah, we're getting close to the wrap up time. So uh, Michelle, perhaps you'd like to share your question with the, with the audience as well. Yeah, thank you. And I think my question also links a lot to the relevance that Irene is just also uh, alluding to, as well as to the comment from, I think, Rudra from um, Nepal, yeah. um, especially around the multi-hazard uh, protocols. Um, I'm, yeah, let me introduce myself as well. I'm anticipatory action advisor working with Oxfam uh, globally. And one of the discussions also that we're having is around making sure that our anticipatory action is relevant. And in many of the cases, what we're seeing is that um, communities at risk are not facing one hazard only. So um, they are really facing different types of um, hazards. So um, yeah, my question is mainly also around um, specific experiences with multi-hazard uh, protocols and also whether in the research this has come up and whether they have been divided um, across the different thematics that the multi-hazard protocols are covering or whether there were no examples of multi-hazard protocols, which I think is, well, at least for our work will be uh, an important distinction to make um, as well in um, understanding what is out there. 
thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, really, this is very practical and good questions here as well. Yeah, uh, yeah, especially, uh, particularly, actually, in the context of Nepal, most of the agencies, uh, they, they have more focus on the floors hazards, you know, that is the single hazards. Uh, for floors in terms of like the riverian floors or fl water injection or flash floors, they are focusing on that area. And more, most of the agencies, they have developed their anticipated action, uh, framework, anticipated actions framework focusing on that hazards. Uh, but particularly in the context of Nepal, uh, yes, the floor, the landslides, uh, thunderbolts, uh, uh, and other, other other hazards also very important. And most of the peoples are losing their lives every year in the hilly and the mountain area as well. In the coming days, like uh, the heat waves and the cold waves, also uh, also the very big issues in the context of Nepal. And this year, only this year, thousands of people were affected by the heat waves and Red Cross movements and other development agencies also engaging to respond to people from the heat waves. But actually, discussing about the, you know, the multi-hazards anticipated actions framework or triggers, that is still in the development process. Like for the floods, it is enough triggers and threshold mechanisms and many of initiatives are happening on that area. But like in the landslides, in the heat waves or in the cold waves, it is the, 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 the initiatives are happening and the, together with the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Authority, that is the government authorities, we are we are working on that and we are developing the you know the early warning systems and mechanisms and 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 you know creating the threshold and some things are happening. Uh, and this year we had a you know you know the big uh, national dialogue on anticipated actions and that that national dialogue uh, you know, the guided by all the agencies to work on the multi hazards systems. But it is progressing, but no no many more results are in hand. So that in the coming days, we will share those results and initiatives with the global community. This is the practice actually, and realistic things here as well. Thank you very much for your questions. Thank you, Rudra. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting actually you know, with uh, the multi hazards uh, that it seems to be a conversation that more and more people are, are having about anticipatory framework. You know, the linear approach of one country, one framework, one hazard is people are saying, well, it's not really a reflection reality. A lot of people are facing more than one situation at a time. And yeah, I know the conflict working group is looking at that in particular. You know, there's an awful lot of hazards that take place in conflict zones and also some of these complex hazards in East uh, Africa as well, You know, where people are facing drought and war and all kinds of things. So there is that work going on. Uh, I would only add the caveat that it makes uh, my work on the maps a bit harder if I have to <laughs> kind of try and merge the icons. So I'm not saying I'm gonna rule it out for future editions, but you know the maps look nice and I don't want to kind of have to emerge it but we'll find a way around that um unfortunately zoom is going to cut us off once again uh things we've changed our accounts which seems to be the problem so I'm going to open the floor for the last two minutes any final reflections from anybody just please unmute and sort of let us know your thoughts in the final two minutes I think for me it would be uh, uh, back to you, team, in terms of, you know, you've had a series of these conversations, like what has been your, putting us on the spot, you know, <laughs> what has stood out for you in terms of the feedback from uh, from your guests, in terms of uh, feedback from the participants? So, yeah. yeah, no, it's a good question. I mean, we're pleased that the, the feedback so far has been positive. Um, you know, people are grateful that the report is there. That's not to say everyone's saying, oh, it's perfect. Um, yeah. It's that people are saying, you know, we needed this as a society, as a community, you know, we needed this as a se sector where people can find that data in one place. Uh, what we're going to be doing, uh, just to kind of turn that question slightly on its head, uh, you know, we're not saying that this is the, the template for the future. We're going to be expanding the data collection, particularly at the dialogue platforms. So people can basically bring their own data, a little bit of a hackathon. And we're, we're looking at the global dialogue platform and Berlin for that for people to come and make sure that their data from their projects is in the report. We will also be doing a couple of surveys, maybe amongst the Anticipation Hub's partners or more widely about, you know, some of the themes, what would you like to see covered? What, you know, what, what was missing out? People are often, uh, you know, quite polite, uh, I find, when, uh, particularly when you've got a new report, they're saying, this is great, but, you know, then this today was a useful um, session for us for getting feedback, you know, what wasn't in there, what needs to be bringing out more. Um, and yeah, so those are the, probably the next steps to look forward to um, is you know, asking people to come and contribute a little bit more. But I think, um, yeah, we're, I have to say, we're pleased with 
the report itself and, and how it's gone. But again, I think we have to say it was a collaborative effort. You know, we would not have been able to do this, Nico, Cara, myself, uh, Joanna, and also Marius and Hiller, who were helping us as well last year with getting everything done. It was, it really needed that team effort with the people from UN Ocha, from World Hunger Hill for FAO, World Food Programme and the Start Network to sort of say, no, we need to change this bit or this bit needs reshaping or the conclusions need to focus here. And just going back to some of the very early points, collaboration was a big theme that came out from our reviewers during the process. You know, it's kind of, that's that's where anticipatory action is going. You know, one one organization, one hazard work country, that's, that's not the future. It's coordination. You know, everyone in a country working on a hazard or multiple hazards, they need to get together. So that that theme in the report did come from I think it's for CUN UN Ultra in particular. Um, and that's a direction that we'll be looking. I think that should the data should reveal a little bit more in the future is rather than you know four hazards for uh, four frameworks, I think it was for drought in one country. I can't remember which off the top of my head. It's like, can we get that to one framework where all the partners are working together? It might not look good for the stats because we're reducing the number of frameworks, but it would look better for collaboration. And that's what the donors and the funders want to see. They want to see all of the actors working together and pulling together and sharing resources, sharing best practices, sharing triggers, that kind of thing. Great. So, um, yeah, Zoom is going to cut us off, as I mentioned. So I'd like to thank all our panelists today for coming along and for sharing their thoughts. I'd like to thank all, all of you that have joined us. Uh, we will be putting the recording, or the two recordings squashed together onto our YouTube channel. We'll be sharing that as well. And if you have any further comments, any further suggestions, in the meantime, what comes to you after the meeting, or what comes from your colleagues, please just send them to us. You can send them to me or to just the Anticipation Hub email, and we'll, we're going to squash all that together and you know, really shape the, the next edition of that overview report. So thanks very much for your time, everyone. And yeah, wishing you a an enjoyable afternoon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. 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 Bye.